forget about this concept of you are the CEO of the product. You are no way the CEO of the product, <laughs> and you will realize this very soon, right? But you are the champion of your product, right? Mm-hmm. The people who go into product management, they go with the sense that product management is just about finding the user needs and then building a product over there, right? And it all seems very fancy, which, which to be quite honest, it is. And I'm very privileged to be in this case, and I'm very happy. Hello everyone. Welcome to the seventh episode of Product Unfiltered. Joining us today, we have Prerath Upal, Principal Product Manager at Adobe. Today, Prerath will talk about his experience building products in the payment and many other domains. Prerath, can you please introduce yourself to our listeners? Uh, hey everyone. Uh, this is Prerath Upal. Uh, currently, I'm a Principal Product Manager at Adobe, and uh, by profession, I have been in product management for over, I want to say, 12 years now, from ranging companies from Yahoo, from eBay, currently at, at Adobe. And um, I started as a software engineer, and then I have transitioned into product management. And product management has become my second home now, uh, certainly. Perfect. Thank, thank you so much, Prerit. In fact, learning about all these experiences which you've gained from the past 12 years, we would love to learn about your journey, you know, from software to product. Uh, certainly. So coming from an India background, uh, and I think a lot of Indians can relate to this, you know, by profession, I never knew about product management. And this is, I'm talking almost 10 to 11 years back when the profession itself had just kind of started and it was not as famous as, as now. Um, and my, my idea was that I wanted to get into the engineering space and software development. So after I completed my undergrad at BYUC, I started as a software developer at, at eBay. And eBay was actually the very first place where I was introduced to product management. I, I really had no idea. And, but I used to be in those sessions that we used to have, user sessions at, at eBay. And it was a very fascinating experience for me when I just used to listen to people. I, I never had never seen how products you know get built, uh, and this was my first exposure over there. And that curiosity and that intrigueness towards understanding a little bit more about the profession got me started into into product management and just learning a little bit more about it. And with that, I almost spent uh, one and a half year as a software developer at at eBay. And then my transition into product management actually happened through an APM program. So uh, Marissa Meyer at that time had just joined Yahoo and she had started her first batch of of associate product managers. And it was a two years program uh, that was introduced and I interviewed for that program. Uh, I had prepared uh, for that interview and at that time, Mind you, the resources were not that many. So I did not even know how to prepare for that particular interview. Uh, but I'm hoping somebody saw, saw something in me uh, uh, over there. And I kind of transitioned through that APM program into, um, into the product management field and got introduced to it. Uh, and went through a mentorship of two years to just hone my skills and develop my skills over there. Perfect. That's so inspiring. In fact, uh, the journey which you shared from software development to product management is something a lot of us have also gone through. Now, talking about this journey from software development, you mentioned that you had this experience of uh, being in a room in, in eBay and learning about product management. So our listeners are always curious, how does a product manager actually manage a product from end to end? So would you like to share any experience building product? How does the journey looks like? Are we really interested in the whole complete process? Uh, sure. So let me take an example, and many of the listeners might relate to it. Uh, Yahoo uh, was is actually a big player in fantasy sports, and Yahoo Sports, Yahoo Finance, still are very strong verticals in that space. Um, and Yahoo Fantasy Sports was certainly doing well, and we wanted to get into the field of daily fantasy, which was more. Of you can think of like a sports gambling um, mm-hmm. uh, where actual exchange of money is, is involved. 
And just to begin with, it was just a hypothesis. So I remember sitting with my manager at that point. Uh, I had joined as an APM, the, the sports mm -hmm. team. And my manager has always been, you know, thinking about this idea. And uh, he and I was sitting and talking about this the whole idea of, of, of um, daily fantasy. And he said, OK, you know what? Uh, let's do this. Let's create a business case over there. Mind you, I had never created a business case. And something mm -hmm. that you will realize as a product manager that it's very critical. Anything that you do, any product that you start would actually first need to have a business case. That what is what is the problem that you're trying to solve? To whom are you catering to? And what is the business value that you are trying to add? Uh, so that was my first step. And in order to do that, I actually interviewed many existing fantasy customers who were actually using Yahoo Sports at that time. And I remember one thing, one very distinct person had actually called out to us that really resonated with me. He said, Predith, you know what? You don't realize this, but in day-to-day -day life, people who are actually doing fantasy sports, they are betting. It just so happens they are not using a portal to bet, but because you are doing it within friends, so you can always hand them cash or you can always use PayPal to send them the money. It just so happens it's not happening through a platform. And that was an idea that it seemed like that, okay, so people are already doing this. Yahoo has a brand of fantasy sports. There's a business value that is there. So maybe we can build that product. And that's how the first step started. And in any product that you'll start, that's where exactly you have to start. You have, our hypothesis was that we had a product, we knew people who are liked daily fantasy, it will be a success. And we had to interview a lot of people to just make sure that we are on the same ground as other, as our, as our consumers over there. So that was the first step. The second idea, second step from there was actually pitching the idea. So it took, the whole thing almost took one and a half months to, or around two months to just wet the idea create a business case, it went through many iterations of the business case and it was presented to our, our um, VP of product at, at that particular point of time. Um, he had a lot of questions. Uh, we had shared a lot of industry trends and he actually then brought in some experts as well. Sometimes you will see that no matter how much data you have, no matter how much information you have, sometimes you will need to bring in certain experts, certain industry experts to build your business case and make a strong case over there. And I remember uh, talking to a few folks and a few folks also came in. And that is how this whole thing started. When we pitched the idea to a VP, then we took the idea to Marissa Meyer and it got approved as a project. And that was just the starting point. The whole thing took almost three to four months to just get the idea approved. And you will see in big organizations, which are specifically very matrixed organizations you need to have these steps and get a buy-in at least from your leadership teams to be able to vet and get the idea off the grounds once all of that was done then actually came the phase where we started putting down the requirements we had we had the resources we started putting down the requirements we started talking to a lot of other teams we started talking to marketing because this was a new product and we wanted to market it with a big bang out there when the NFL season starts. We started talking to our engineering folks. We started talking to our legal teams. We were going into this new space mm -hmm. and we wanted to be very careful because Yahoo had a brand name to maintain. And we did not want the brand to be associated something with something that is not appropriate, right? Mm -hmm. We had to be very careful. Um, so we consulted with our legal teams made sure the right terms and conditions, work with our design, work with the finance. Yahoo has never done a microtransaction product. They did not know how microtransactions of $5 or $10 work because we are an Yahoo historically and is also right now was a advertising business. True. So the finance teams did not understand this concept of microtransactions over there. So there were a lot of stakeholders that needed a lot of education to begin with, that what exactly is this product, what we are trying to solve, and why we want to solve this, and what will be the business impact. In parallel to that, 
there are a lot of other steps that kept taking place creating marketing material talking to celebrities when we will launch this particular product right what will be the product launch plan how are we going to roll it out how will we ab test this in the market mm -hmm. how will we make sure nothing goes wrong what metrics we would measure once we launch and not only once we launch what metrics would we measure on the first day on the seventh day on the 14th day after a month to mm -hmm. see how the product is doing over the period of time and last but certainly not the least we had to create a very exhaustive communication plan to our leadership team also uh, one thing which i want to understand is so you have seen the product space from a very broad spectrum starting from an apm then moving to a product manager role and then going up the ladder and currently you are working as a principal product manager so in terms of freedom and responsibility how has your journey been at different roles in the product space i will say this rahul that what happens is that when you start as a when you start as a as an apm right initially uh, what will happen is you will be given certain small small opportunities and small small tasks over mm -hmm. there you have to understand that in any company that you join and this is a misconception a lot of product managers have that they think that they will join the company and they will change the company right mm -hmm. everything that predecessor has done is wrong everything that i am going to do is right right yeah. and that mentality generally does not fly at least in a big organization as you move up the ladder you also have to realize is your credibility among your stakeholders keeps on growing the expectations that they have of you also keeps on growing for example as an apm if you are just managing your product right but as a senior product manager it is expected that you would actually have an impact on your org itself mm -hmm. right it's not your initiatives are not just for your product as a principal your expectation is you will have a company wide impact and not mm -hmm. just on your org over there so as you grow the, the expectations that you that the uh, company has from you and your business partners and stakeholders will continue to grow over the period of time we will start from the product to an org to actually a company that mm -hmm. and wide impact that you have to do right and that responsibility increases if you continue to deliver on that the trust that your stakeholders will have will continue to increase make sure that you guys you know when you guys also join as you know amazing product managers communicate to every stakeholder you might feel it's not necessary but it's very very critical be crisp be clear be to the point in your communication and i cannot stress more how important this soft skill is be very data oriented if a stakeholder comes to you and says this is what i think needs to happen sit down with that person and look at the excel sheet and challenge the hypothesis if it needs to be challenged that why this hypothesis is where are these numbers coming in and you have vetted it out and third thing that i would certainly say with any stakeholder uh, 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 that you have that be humble don't go in a room thinking that you know the best mm -hmm. go in a room thinking that you will learn and you will pivot if pivot is needed over there so mm -hmm. that way you will trust me you will gain credibility much sooner mm -hmm. as product managers it's really important to also learn about technical skills that is data analytical skills and other important technical skills in the same domain so my first question is as a product manager how important are these skills when you join any organization and secondly if you do not have these skills how can you grasp these skills with them so uh, that's a that's a very interesting question akash and and i'll say this being a tech, so see i come from a computer science background so mm -hmm. i take some of these skills for granted because i have been educated in those skills right and i am very cognizant that not everyone comes from the same background if you just ask me technical skills i would say they are they are relevant you should know about those technical skills at a high level meaning if somebody you know is going to the browser how is going to function if someone is talking about microservices how does it function so that you can at least have 
educated discussions with your engineering counterparts and leads you don't have to design trust your teams right mm -hmm. but you should be able to ask educated questions in the teams right so if you have that knowledge that high level knowledge that would be awesome that being said having the technical skill to be able to extract data to personally to me it's very very critical you will be surprised utkarsh and and rahul that while there are all these big companies out there they are always in crunch of data analysts and data analysts are always in high demand so you will not have there could be occasions you might not have the right people right mm -hmm. to me knowing how to run an sql query knowing how to run um a splunk query really really helps because yes i can certainly outsource it if the team has bandwidth if the team does not have bandwidth i am not bound and i am not waiting on somebody else to help me out you will feel very uh, challenged if you don't have these skill set to be able to extract data and mm -hmm. to be able to make sense out of that data so if someone has to learn something i would say please take a crash course on sql or take a crash course on splunk to just be able to extract the data last point i will make on this is that i am also not an expert right mm -hmm. what generally happens is in a day to day life and this is a real example i will write a query i'm doing a left join a right join or something is not working i will write a query the data does not look correct i immediately give it to my data analyst and ask him can you correct this query for me and this is a real example and i have done that many times right mm -hmm. my data analyst who is on our team an amazing guy he appreciates it so much he immediately correct it and he'll give it to me and i can just run it and i can get the data out just mm -hmm. see that how much you have reduced the churn in between because the capacity was not there he was busy with something else over there mm -hmm. in order to learn this i would say thrash if you go today to udemy or if you go to coursera or even if you go to you know youtube you can find so many resources that if someone tells me that they don't they cannot learn these things over there and they are not able to find resources online then i would really question that <laughs> question that <laughs> point over there uh so there are many many resources and even company you know even uh, schools like uc berkeley and stanford there are many free material that they actually provide online that you can mm -hmm. just go learn it uh and and do it one easiest way is that on your job when you are doing start small start understanding the systems start writing small small queries select star whatever right just start mm -hmm. writing small small things over the period of time you will learn but the biggest hurdle anyone has is that that fear in the heart mm -hmm. i don't want to do it i don't want to learn it why because it takes effort it mm -hmm. takes time it takes patience so i would say to any aspiring product manager or an existing product manager learn it sooner mm -hmm. than later you know prince that's that's very true that uh, as a product manager you need to constantly learn and evolve yeah. but there are also instances where an existing product manager might be belonging to certain industry and now he or she will be switching to a different industry where they might not have a lot of insights or knowledge about so what would be your suggestion to them on how do they navigate their path so i will give an example uh, over here uh, rahul that uh, i had a short stint I, i moved to a ge healthcare because i wanted to just try that space and i had not done that space at all like in ebay i had done some of the payment stuff at yahoo i was payments wallet and adobe i'm billing at other companies i was also in payments fintech space but healthcare i had not done couple of things that that i i certainly did right i made sure that i collaborate with my business partners very closely because business teams are generally very well versed i used to listen to them i used to see how they are talking about also what i started doing was i started attending some of the conferences that happen on the healthcare side because there used to be so many stakeholders that used to come to those conferences from hospitals to the isv partners that are there and creating you know a uh, uh, software for those hospitals and actually a lot of different industry leaders and practitioners like doctors and nurses who used to come to these conferences that you learn a lot from mm -hmm. these conferences right 
at the same time, I actually also started researching and finding literature online that my manager, you know, who was again an industry veteran had over there. So these to me were my three key resources. Mm -hmm. Very true. Uh, in fact, Prajat, uh, very rightly mentioned going to conferences. This is something me and Rahul have actually experienced in the Bay Area, the kind of knowledge which you gain from these experiences. Are great. Yes. But wh while Prajat, you were talking about different resources which you took while you were product manager to understand the industry in detail, what are some other advice which you would want to share with aspiring product managers who want to get into product management? to first of all learn the aspects of product management and secondly to gain that product sense because that is really important for any aspiring team. So first of all I will say Utkarsh for any aspiring product manager who used to join this space right forget about this concept of you are the CEO of the product you mm -hmm. are no way the CEO of the product <laughs> and you will realize this very soon right but you are the champion of your product right. Mm -hmm. People who go into product management, they go with the sense that product management is just about finding the user needs and then building a product over there, right? Mm -hmm. And it all seems very fancy, which, which to be quite honest, it is. And I'm very privileged to be in this space and I'm very happy to be in this space. Product management, that is certainly one aspect to it. There are many more dimensions to product management. You will be surprised how much of negotiation that you would have to do with all the other stakeholders. Mm -hmm. You will be surprised by how much communication you would have to do. And not only just communication, like over communication at times that you will have to do when you are a product manager over there. And also managing the expectations. Imagine if you are building a product and that product you have almost 26 different stakeholders in 26 different teams with 26 different roadmaps and their own objectives of what they are trying to achieve. Managing the expectations for any product manager becomes extremely, extremely hard. And the last point that I will say to any product manager and especially have seen this with aspiring product manager, they come up with, they come to the table with an attitude that it's we are going to build the best thing. So they, it's, it's a binary to them. It's either one or zero. What many times you will understand in product management that it's always a gray area in between. If you cannot build everything right in one go, you will have to figure out a way to build a good enough stuff and then iterate over it. Because any company that you will go and the complaints that you will hear from any product manager. And this is this I have heard so many times from different aspiring product managers. Oh, you know what? The problem is I'm working on a legacy platform and that's why you cannot build X, Y, Z. Yeah. Guess what? Any company you will go, any aspiring product manager, you will hear the same problem. It just never goes away. Because by the time you have moved from a legacy platform to a new platform, that new platform will get obsolete <laughs> in the next five yeah. years. Right. So any product folks, these are key things that I would say that keep in mind with respect to gaining a product sense. I would say few questions and these are just logical questions because that and, and Rahul that someone would ask. These are not I'm not parting anything that you might not know, mm -hmm. but anything that you are looking at, right? Just ask a simple question that like, why would someone have built this product? Whom would it cater to, right? For example, you take you know, Uber, take an Uber, right? Why would somebody build an Uber? There is a taxi. If you think about it, if somebody built an Uber, you know, I see aspiring product managers say, oh, you know what? It made payments very easy. I can just, you know, scroll up and down and figure what is going on. What is actually going on? What is Uber really doing is catering to the people like me who are just lazy, mm -hmm. right? who are just lazy, who don't want to do things. And I am happy to pay that money just to save time and effort, right? Because by the end of the day, all they are doing is taking you from time from point A to point B, but they are catering in a very nice way to my laziness, which is my intrinsic need. And I'm just willing to pay, right? So if you start asking these basic questions, you know, whenever you look at the product and ask two questions, why would they build it 
for what user and the you know user need that they would be solving and second also ask the question how are they going to create a business case out of this so right? mm-hmm. a lot of product managers only focus on the user need but forget the actual business case sometimes you know the user need might be there but there is no business value and you will find it you will find it very hard to then you know uh, uh, get those things prioritized right for example if i have 1 million users and 10 users need something and they really really need it right mm-hmm. maybe you might make a decision that for those 10 users you might not build that feature although you have recognized the need over there mm-hmm. so just ask these two questions whenever you look at a product why would they have built it what kind of a need that they would be solving right for this customer and if that product is a success then how would have the business case been for this particular product perfect thank you so much prerit for sharing this now let's move on to the next segment of our podcast the product paradox so my first question to you prerit is should payment uh, systems prioritize ease of use and convenience even if it means sacrificing the security of the product see the security of a product uh um rahul comes at, at at really a high cost specifically in a payments domain if someone to say to me that the sanctity of a credit card information or a sanctity of a customer's personal information is at risk my answer is just no it's not worth it right you have to find ways around it to make sure that the security and i'm putting security in a very crisp terms of pi information a customer information because it's people's money you cannot play with it you cannot take it lightly so the answer would be a product does not developing a feature does not outweigh security of a customer over there security is a human need right again it's a need you cannot play with that human need Okay. Uh, so, Prerit, the next question is: Should product managers prioritize the ethical implications of the product, even if it means sacrificing revenue or market share? You will soon realize that while uh, let me first define, you know, when you say ethics, ethics can come in a lot of contexts. It can come in the context of customer safety. Ethics can come in context of transparency. It can come in context of privacy. fairness etc right whenever you actually sway away from these ethics you might be able to win the ground the mark excuse me the market share in short run right to get the revenue to get the business impact but as a product manager your objective is not to see how stock is doing or how wall street is doing in the next quarter your objective is to see how the business is being valued in next 2 to 5 years mm-hmm. so please and i cannot stress that more that do not compromise your ethics with respect to the points that i have mentioned customer safety transparency privacy and fairness at all keeping in mind the long term vision of the product mm-hmm. Uh, my next question to you prerit is is it important to have a diverse perspective on product teams Yes, that's that's the simplest answer that that I can I can I can I can give you. How I think is not same as how you think is not same as how Utkarsh thinks is not same as how my wife thinks or my fiance thinks is not same as how um, uh, 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 a person of minority thinks. Mm-hmm. You will never, and I cannot stress this more. You will never be able to build a product if you do not. have a diversity of thought you need to have a diversity of thought when you are building a product now how you get that diversity of thought can be done in many ways but if you don't have a representation of a diversity of thought in your product it will not succeed so it's it's very very critical to have that so the next question prerit is should product managers be responsible to foster a culture of innovation or should it be left to the senior leadership so there are both types that happen in some companies as you know they just lead to the senior citizenship but let me put it this way right 
innovation is not a responsibility of one person. You know, I have seen at companies they have innovation leaders who just focus on innovation. That's just not how innovation works. There are people who will have focused time to just innovate. I don't understand that concept that you have one hour where I will innovate. What mm-hmm. will I innovate? I don't know. But in this one hour, I will innovate. Right? Mm-hmm. Innovation just doesn't work that way. Uh, I have never seen a company from Yahoo to eBay to uh, Adobe, right? Even at Yapster, right? Where innovation is a top down that happens, right? Innovation has to come from everywhere. And this is certainly a motto that Adobe has, that innovation has to come from everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. Only thing that as a product manager one has to do is you have to fight for your innovation and you have to validate that innovative idea, which takes struggle, which takes time, which takes effort, because anyone can come up with an innovative thought. Proving it and going it through with it is altogether a different ball game for any for any product manager. Mm-hmm. Thank you, thank you so much, Prerit, for sharing such an inspiring answers. I'm I'm sure that our listeners will implement this in their day to day journey too. This brings us officially to the end end of today's podcast. Hope you all enjoyed today's episode and our discussion has helped learn something new. Stay tuned for more such exciting episodes. Thank you so much for tuning into Product Unfiltered.